So good evening and welcome to my first webinar for the BGA and UK Junior Gliding. This was originally put together for UK Junior Gliding, but it's kind of morphed a little bit uh, into one of the BGA series, uh, probably my own fault. Um, so this is on uh, buying, owning, running your first aeroplane. Uh, we're kind of coming up to that time of year when everyone sat around thinking, I've got nothing else to do, I'll have a look on the classified adverts. So uh, we're just going to have a bit of a chat about... Well, by the end of this presentation, um, hopefully you'll understand uh, why buying or sharing an aeroplane can make sense. Um, uh, where to look, how to buy an aeroplane, uh, what to do when you've bought one, uh, other than get in it and fly it. Um, and we're also going to look at costs as well, because um, a couple of people have asked me for that, trying to get an idea of what it's going to cost to run your own aeroplane. Um, most webinars have had these. Okay, hold on. Slide there. Uh, most webinars have had these, um, all the uh, about me's and uh, home truths start coming out. So I started gliding at 1998 in Pocklington. Uh, I'm a northerner at heart, just exiled down in southern UK. Um, I came back to gliding in Bicester in 2011, having uh, got my PPL, uh, got a career sorted out and everything else. Um, I was at Bicester until uh, the club moved out in uh, July this year. I'm now based mainly at Booker, but I also instruct over at Weston on the Green. Uh, I'm an assistant instructor, uh, Part 66 L1 licensed engineer, which is the old BGA inspector, um, a tuggy and a motor glider instructor as well. Um, I own my own DG200, and I've got a share in a Robin DR400 uh, as well, so pretty heavily leveraged into aeroplanes. Um, so before we get stuck in, um, I do want to kind of make a couple of assumptions here. First up, um, you're not going to be buying the farm. Um, it's not unheard of, but it would be pretty unusual for you to buy a brand new aeroplane straight from the factory as your first aircraft. Um, now, if you do want to do this, support from the majority of manufacturers in the UK is very, very good. You've got Southern Sailplanes for Schemp, uh, Zulu Glass Tech for Slyker, McLean for DG and uh, all the others as well. Um, you just call them up and, hey, presto, a glider arrives shortly thereafter. For most people, though, that's beyond their financial means, so we're going to be looking mostly at used aeroplanes here. Uh, and on that, we're going to keep this to the UK. Um, there's undoubtedly more inventory of aircraft for sale in Europe than there is in the UK. Um, however, unless you're buying something very niche, it's unusual to not find what you're looking for on these shores. Um, it's not unheard of, but um, it's pretty unlikely. So just for the sake of time and ease, we're only going to think about buying something in the UK. Um, the whole Europe thing's also been complicated uh, by Brexit. Don't ask. Um, we're going to keep this really, really simple and assume that it's just on these shores. Okay. At some point in time, I might find a shortcut for the next slide. Um, so, why buy your own aeroplane? Um, there's lots of different reasons uh, that people have for doing it. Um, you might have um, outgrown your club fleet. Um, some clubs have only got wooden aeroplanes. Um, K6, Pirat, K8, some of the smaller clubs. Um, can be quite a luxury for a club to have anything greater than an Astyr, Saturat, Discus, Celis 4 or anything like that. It's a lot of money to have tied up uh, in an aeroplane that um, doesn't really appeal to a lot of pilots. Um, you're going to outgrow something wooden pretty quickly once you've got yourself a badge, if you've got aspirations other than just pottering around on a sunny day. Um, they are actually quite a good investment. Um, gliders very seldom lose value um, for no apparent reason. Um, sometimes they go up in value. It's not unheard of. Um, most people keep their aircraft for three to five years, so any capital expense that isn't recouped at sale is normally spread over the period of ownership works out pretty favorably in comparison to renting an aircraft. Um, give you an idea, um, if you've got a season ticket offer at your club, 500 pounds, um, well, if you keep your airplane for three years, um, you can afford 1500 pounds really over um, what you would have spent on a season ticket. It's a bit man maths, but it's something to think about. Peace of mind, um, this is a really big one, especially for me. Um, you know your aircraft, um, exactly where everything is, exactly how it goes together and what condition it's in, who's been maintaining it, who's been looking after it, who's been flying it. Um, it's that peace of mind that you have from having things like you know, your own car and that sort of stuff. Um, owning a glider is really, really easy. All right, rock up, rig, go flying, pretty simple, not much more to it than that. There is a bit more to it, but it's not an all-consuming burden on your time. There's plenty of help and support out there available um, for you to do that. Um, greater independence. Um, this is really, really important as well. Um, 
you're no longer reliant on club aircraft sort of turning up on uh, turning up at the airfield at seven o'clock uh, on in the morning on the first 300k day of the year um, only to find one of the club old boys has already put his name uh, on the only aircraft that's available for his one hour flight slap bang in the middle of the day and it means you're already going to be limited to local soaring uh, you can go to competitions expeditions and ultimately do an awful lot more flying um, owning was the key thing that kind of transformed my flying. That's also something that Jake and Finn picked up on their um, Jump to Champ webinar. Doesn't really matter what it is, get an aeroplane, go flying. So, uh, next up, what to buy. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on this um, because we've got 65 attendees on here and everyone's circumstances and everything are different. Um, but some things that influence the whole what to buy um, equation. Aspirations. Um, what do you want to do throughout your period of ownership? Um, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I want to go and fly nationals in the next couple of years, probably best off not starting with the K6 unless it's the juniors, in which case, go for it. Budget. This is a really, really big one. Um, how much have you got available to spend and how much can you afford to um, kind of spend on ongoing costs? And we'll talk about those later. Where are you going to keep it? Um, you might consider joining another club for your own aeroplane. There's plenty of people out there that are members of more than one club um, who instruct at one club, fly cross country from another. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, are you going to buy a share or outright? Um, shares are a great way of using a limited budget. Um, three people around something like a Libel or a Cirrus, your cash outlay on that's going to be pretty low, somewhere between two and four thousand pounds. It's not a lot of money, really. Um, and shares, again, most gliders shares, they trade relatively easily, relatively quickly. Um, you've also got your kind of own little bubble of ongoing help and support and also lower costs as well. Three people around an aeroplane makes it um, not quite cheaper than walking, but pretty close. Um, project aeroplanes, <laughs> this is a tricky one. Um, every club that I've ever been to has got a trailer park queen that hasn't seen the light of day in years. Um, Go into them with your eyes wide open. Um, it could be a time consuming heap that actually kind of destroys your ownership experience. They're not always bad ideas, but they might not always be good ones. Um, and if you are going to go down the project route, you have been offered a project, get someone uh, that knows aeroplanes on site to help you uh, hold your hand through it and kind of um, give you support to whatever it is that you need to do. The two tables uh, on the right hand side give a couple of um, advantages and disadvantages to wooden kind of first generation stuff that you are going to be looking at buying as a potential first aeroplane. So wood's pretty cheap to buy, um, you know, K6, uh, Skylark, Dart, that sort of stuff. Most of them, it's unusual to spend more than, I don't know, four, six thousand pounds, something like that. Most of them are pretty simple to fly. Um, the Great Club aeroplanes, great, well supported through the Vintage Gliding Club. Um, some types no longer in the Astra as well, which um, potentially gives you a bit more medical and licensing flexibility. Disadvantages, they're pretty easy to outgrow, um, especially after you've done your silver and 100k diploma. Um, you're going to be waiting. There's no reason to say you can't do 300, 500 and K6, um, Skylark, Dart, that sort of stuff. They do happen, um, but you're going to be really limiting yourself on the number of days that you can do it. Um, they're getting harder to maintain. Um, it's fine for the enthusiast, but um, most wooden gliders have got glue inspections attached to them. Um, parts, again, can be tricky to get hold of for some aeroplanes. Um, transportation, uh, if you're buying a vintage aeroplane, you're either going to get a fantastic trailer that's been doted on or something that's been you know, 30, 40 years old. We're going to talk more about transportation later because that's a pretty big one. Um, some idiosyncratic designs. Uh, the best thing about a lot of wooden aeroplanes was we, uh, when they were designing them, people came up with some really off-the-wall ideas. Um, expandable main pins um, is yeah, a great one. Um, SHK, Cobra, Foker, that sort of stuff. They're not wrong, they're just a bit different, and we, ne we didn't really copy them in anything else, so it's stuff to be aware of. Um, First-gen glass fibre, so Labels, Cirruses. Astis, all that kind of stuff. Um, you do get an awful lot for your money. Um, our club of steer at Bista knew its way around 300s, 500s. Um, Labels are still competitive at the, uh, and Cirruses as well for that matter. So competitive at club class, um, all the way up to national and international level. Um, most first generation stuff's really well supported by type certificate holders. Um, so you call them up and they help you out. Um, they're affordable to operate. Uh, if you've bought an Astir or a DG, um, they were finished in Schwabalak, 
probably never need refinishing unless they've been um, refinished in the past with gel. Um, refinishing is or can be cripplingly expensive um, and it can make an aircraft an economic write-off. You know, we're back into enthusiast territory. Um, very few of these aeroplanes would be classed as niche. Um, some of the wooden stuff, the vintage stuff, would probably are kind of niche aeroplanes that didn't build many of them for whatever reason. There's hundreds of Libels out there. You know, Libels, Cirruses, they're pretty ubiquitous. Every club's got them. Um, that's a good thing because it means there's always people around that can help you and kind of talk through what you're going to do. Disadvantages, 40-year-old aeroplanes seldom got uh, no accident history. Um, again, it's not a problem um, as long as, you know, it's been repaired, regularly inspected, everything else well documented, all that sort of stuff. Some aircraft, the refinished clock's going to be ticking. Um, you know, some of these Cirruses, uh, SW19, um, you can tell by looking kind of how close you are to the next refinish. Uh, life inspection, most, although not all, gliders are limited to 3,000 hours before they've got to have a life inspection. We'll talk about that later, um, but it's something to be aware of. Um, be aware of handling quirks. We were still ironing out something, ironing out some of the... Um, not problems, but, you know, initial kind of concepts of design. Um, you know, much is said about offset hooks, um, air brake effectiveness, all that sort of stuff. None of it's a great problem. You just need to be kind of aware of it when uh, converting to the aeroplane and it needs to be managed. They're not issues. If they were issues, then people wouldn't be buying them or flying them anymore. Uh, and they still are. So let's go on to where to look. Um, so you're going shopping. Um, first things first, start your own club. Have a look on your doorstep. Um, ask around. Um, buying on history is a really, really useful thing. We'll talk about this later. Aircraft that have been in the club for years are normally reasonably safe bets when it comes to acquisition. Now, everyone's known that aeroplane or everyone's flown it. It's well thought after. It's well regarded and everything else. Um, word of mouth's really, really good as well. Um, they might not be at your club, but someone probably knows someone somewhere that's selling something. Um, I have a customer recently that bought a DG100 probably two days before it went on the market. Um, the owner got what he wanted. Um, the new buyer um, got exactly what he wanted as well. Um, word of mouth saved an awful lot of hacking about. Um, if that doesn't turn anything up, gliderpilot.net's brilliant. Um, their adverts classified section um, is uh, a really good starting point as well for kind of looking, just seeing what's out there, valuing your own aeroplane and looking for aeroplanes. Um, occasionally we see stuff on the socials, pops up on Facebook, and we'll put a link to someone saying, you know, this is for sale, um, get in touch with this guy if interested. Um, can work, uh, you do see stuff on there occasionally. Pretty difficult to search for, you just need to keep your eye out, keep looking. Um, and the last one, free gliders, everyone likes free stuff. Um, they are out there. Um, if you're a woman, uh, Women Glide UK have previously given the use of gay six to female pilots. Great for a season. Um, uh, I think there's a couple of people on, uh, in the chat box as well that have kind of benefited from this as well. Watch out on Facebook for them. They come up. UK Junior Gliding can probably find uh, you in an aeroplane as well or a seat as well. They may also next year have a uh, gliders giveaway on a similar basis to Woman Glide UK. So, you know, keep your eyes open. Um, to be honest, it doesn't matter what it is. Just say yes. All right. If it's free, Give it a go, see what happens, apply for it. It's like any sponsorship, any scholarship, any bursary. Um, you ain't going to get it if you don't uh, at least apply or ask for it. So the fun bit, you found the aeroplane. You found the aeroplane. Good news. Um, first thing, get help. Take somebody with you. Um, this is really, really important. Um, an inspector, an instructor, someone familiar with the type, doesn't matter. Don't go on your own. Um, it's a little bit like kind of buying a used car, you know, never rock up on a council estate at nine o'clock on a night and expect to have bought an absolute peach. Horror stories are out there, um, unfortunately. Um, there are aircraft that might not necessarily be what they seem. Um, I know of at least one or two aeroplanes that are floating around at the minute that have got valid arcs, um, but following the arc, one heavy landing showed up an awful lot of badly repaired damage um, that made the aircraft an economic write-off, unfortunately. Um, a good inspector, instructor, or someone that knows that type will spot stuff like that and say, well, this isn't necessarily brilliant. Um, whenever I'm taking a customer to go and have a look at an airplane for the first time, the first thing we do, do you fit in it? Um, some people just don't fit in some airplanes, and not all gliders are alike. Uh, Labelle's are a really good example here. 
Um, some of the bells with the racing canopy, uh, if you're anything over about five foot eight, getting you in there is going to be a struggle. At the same time, uh, I know of at least one guy who's north of six foot and with short shoulders as broad as me that gets in the bells with a normal canopy quite happily, might not fit in another one. All right, some of the early stuff. Cirruses, you're probably absolutely fine. DGs, yeah, most people get reasonably comfortable if you're happy with being pigeon-toed. Um, but if you can't get comfortable in an aeroplane, it's pretty much pointless sticking in anything else. Um, sometimes no amount of cushions, parachutes, padding, shuffling the seat around, you just can't get settled in something. It's pretty much pointless moving much further on if you can't do that. Um, you could be spending five, six, seven, eight hours sat in that cockpit. Um, and if, you can't, if you're not comfortable after five or ten minutes, you ain't going to make it through your first um, uh, five hours, 500k or anything like that. Um, condition, this pretty much speaks for itself. Um, you know, what's the final finish look like? Is it starting to crack? Is it painted? Kind of all this good stuff. What cracks in the canopy are they being repaired? Does it look like a spider's nest, anything like that? Um, life limitation, we've spoken about this briefly already. So um, most, although not all gliders, have got life limitation at 3,000 hours. Um, I think a couple of the French built Centra stuff, Pegas 20F, uh, don't have a 3,000 hour, I think they go up to six. Um, most gliders, they generally tend not to fail their life extensions, but it can be a significant cost to get it through. And we're talking normally between two and 4,000 pounds, sometimes higher, depending on what you've got to do. Sometimes you've got to chop holes in the wings, which is a bit of a pain. Sometimes you can do it with just a boroscope. If you're buying an aeroplane at 2,700 hours and you do 60 hours a year, you're going to be doing that life inspection. Um, because why buy an aircraft that's due as life inspection? You might as well get somebody else to take the hit. Um, it's something to think about, especially if you know, you're know you buying north of 2,500 hours. 60 hours a year for a sole owner, between 60 and 100 hours is probably about right to work on. Um, my usage seems to work out at about between 60 and 75 most years, a bit lower this year for obvious reasons. Um, kit's a big one. Uh, it's not just the glider. All right. Radio, most gliders start to see 833 radios coming through now. Um, not having an 833 radio, there's um, it's not a huge problem, but bear in mind when you do the replacement, you're probably going to need a new microphone. You might need new speakers as well. Then you're probably in for a rewire. Again, it's not difficult. It's not time consuming, but there is a cost associated with it. Um, and there's more to it than just swapping the box out invariably. Some of the older design radios um, were weird shapes, not 57 or 80 millimeters. So then you're in for a new panel and then you, it all ends badly. This is why taking someone with you that understands um, kind of the aircraft, what you've got to do kind of makes a lot of sense. Farm, uh, it's mandatory at some clubs now, um, probably for the better. Think of it as uh, like wearing a crash helmet when you're going skiing or riding a bike. Um, I don't wear a crash helmet. Uh, when I'm on a bike because I think I might fall off. I'm worried someone's going to knock me off. Um, so whatever you can do to make yourself more visible, certainly to other gliders, that kind of helps. Um, I'm pretty, yeah, there's a couple of clubs that um, won't let gliders fly from there if they haven't got fly now, I'm pretty certain. I think Boyne's one of them. Um, loggers, um, if you need your badges or you want to compete, you're going to need an IGC logger of some description. Might be the FLAM, not all FLAMs are IGC certified, so something to think about there as well. Um, Vario, um, is it legacy equipment? Um, LNAV, Cambridge 302, LX1000, they're all great. They work really, really well. They've got a diehard following. Um, some of them are getting on for over 20 years old now. Um, they won't last forever. Uh, unfortunately, they do fail um, eventually. You might just want something a bit more modern. Um, might not give you a final glide, might not give you a digital average. Um, I've seen a couple of aircraft that had really intermittent sound outputs as well, which is really annoying. Um, parachute, how old is it? Does it come with one? When was it repacked? That thing's going to save your life. All right. Use parachutes are absolutely fine. Um, the first thing I do if I've, boarded, if I've got a glider with a uh, used parachute, get it repacked, find out what sort of condition it's in, make sure it's comfortable when it's on as well. Some of them being badly packed, it could be sorted out. Yeah, it's things to think about. Um, oxygen, you might never need it. But if you're after your diamonds, probably helpful to have. Can you fit it in? Has it got the fittings for it? Kind of things to think about. And it comes back to what we spoke about earlier with the aspirations. You know, what do you want to do with this glider over the next three, four, five years? Um, you might never want to go wave flying. You know, you get a gold height, 12,000 feet, perfectly high enough. That's it. Pull the brakes, come back down. Third diamond, not bothered. Um, 
Continuity, something I've looked for when uh, I've bought aircraft previously and uh, when I've acted on behalf of customers, is continuity. Um, who's been looking after it? There's nothing kind of really better than seeing the same inspectors looked after that airplane for the last 10 years because you can give them a call and say, I'm thinking about buying this airplane, what's it like? They'll give you a really, really good um, kind of synopsis of kind of what it's um, what it's been up to, what they've seen, all that sort of stuff. Um, how many owners has it had in recent memory is another good one. G Info, the um, CA provide a really good way of finding out. Again, it's not necessarily a bad thing an aircraft's being passed around. Um, the glider in the picture there uh, was a DG100 for one of my customers. Um, that was that had been based at that airfield for about 20 years, and it was, makes no difference. It had three owners in that time, and it had only ever been between two or three different inspectors. It was a um, that's the sort of thing I'm kind of looking for um, from a continuity point of view. It's not to say it's a bad thing if it's gone from inspector to inspector to inspector or if it's been passed around owners, but the key thing is you know, why? You know, what's the backstory? Um, lastly, the trailer. This is a big one. Um, and I've been a victim of this myself. Um, bad trailers will give you a really, really, really bad time. Um, a wooden chassis for me is alarm bells straight away because most no one's built a trailer with a wooden chassis in about 20 years. Um, they rot really, really badly. And when they rot, you're going to have a really bad time trying to replace it. Uh, does it leak? Um, you can tell, look at four. All right, you'll see water stains on the floor. Glider might not necessarily be damp, but uh, a leaky roof shows itself up really, really quickly. Um, Again, a rotten floor, uh, it's fixable, but it takes time and you're gonna spend your winter rolling around on a hangar floor with um, some 19 mil ply and lots of nails, kind of really hating life, to be honest. It's cold, it's miserable. Um, I had a glass fiber trailer that was in two halves and at some point in time, um, someone completely by accident had hit the side of the trailer and the trailer caved in on itself. That was an absolute nightmare to repair. Um, it's quite specialized work as well. There's not many companies that will do it. It's expensive. Yeah, it's just a bit of a pain and it's something to think about. Um, I'd walk away from an average glider with an average or poor trailer, um, unless I knew I could get another trailer from somewhere else pretty easily. Um, same when we come back to talking about wooden aeroplanes. Um, you're not going to be buying, or it's very unusual, you're going to be buying a K6 or a Skylark with a Cobra trailer. Uh, so have a look at the box that it comes in. Understand the fittings, how well it goes together, how well it all goes in. Um, bad fittings can cause damage to your glider. The last thing you want on um, you know, the first 300k day of the year or the day when you're going for your 50, you use puncture a wing, pulling it out on a badly made tie down or a badly made fitting in the trailer. Yeah, it's things that are gonna give you a bad time. Okay. Do, 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 do. And if I go down on see this one. So with all that in mind, uh, you've shut hands on a deal. Great news. Uh, you're now a happy aircraft owner, potentially. A um, couple of things for you to think about. Documentation-wise, bill of sale. Uh, generally speaking, it's not mandatory. It can be nice to have. Um, there are various templates out there. I've got a couple available that I've used in the past. Um, what you need to do, complete the form CA1 available on the CAA website. Return it to the CAA with the old registration certificate. That is surrendered as part of the change of ownership because your certificate of registration proves who owns the aeroplane. Slightly different cars when the proof of registered keeper isn't necessarily the owner. Um, send your four, CA one form off to the CAA with um, the princely sum of £78 and they will send it straight back to you. Doesn't necessarily have to be registered at your home address. Uh, you can register it through your club. Some clubs allow that, some don't. Um, I'm not going to go into why. It's basically, CAA registration is a matter of the public record. It's a long story. I don't really understand it. Um, there might also be a syndicate agreement. If you bought a share in an aeroplane, most syndicates have um, an agreement in place which explains who does what, things about fair usage, who pays what, fees, everything along those lines. Um, I get kind of a little bit wary over pages, like five, six page syndicate agreement, syndicate agreements, because you've got to think, you know, why is it this long? You know, what's happened in the past that's meant these scenarios have been an issue? Um, you might even want to have a look at a syndicate agreement before you agree to buying the aeroplane. Um, but that's probably up to your own discretion. And again, if you're buying into an active syndicate, chances are you probably know that aeroplane anyway. Uh, so it's something to think about. Um, competition number. Yeah, you bought an aeroplane with a funky number on the back of it. Um, comp numbers belong to the person, not the glider. All right. Whereas the registration belongs to the serial number and can't be transferred, the competition number can. Um, the BGA will tell you what you can and can't have. 
Uh, there's many different connotations. Some of them have been, most of the good ones have been taken already. Um, uh, come up with a list, send them to the BJA office. They'll tell you what's available. Um, it's something like 80 pounds for five years. I'm too tight to pay for one. Um, I'll just make do with Delta Tango Mike and have done. Um, your comp number, if you've bought a new one, it needs to be displayed under the wing and on the fin of the aeroplane. Um, there's rules about the design and everything else for the comp number. Be a very, very picky arc inspector that um, said you can't have that. Uh, but it's um, the one that must be displayed. G reg has got to be on the side of the aeroplane and under the other wing as well. I can't remember which way around it is. Um, insurance. Insurance justifies its own webinar at the minute um, because it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, we're going to talk through it as quickly and as easily as we can. But basically, there's two contingent parts to your insurance, third party liability and whole value. Third party liability is what pays out if you wrap your glider around a school, puppy farm, um, kitten sanctuary, anything like that. That's what pays the third parties. There is a minimum value. I think it's around five million dollars, uh, five million pounds there or thereabouts. Um, makes up about 70 percent of your total premium. Um, whole value. Um, the best way of explaining this, if you bought a car, it's got an agreed value. Um, hull value, you can name your own hull value. Um, but when doing that, you've got to bear in mind that an aircraft is normally written off at between 70 and 85, when a repair exceeds 70 to 85% of hull value. Um, so the scenario is you've brought um, a glider that you think is worth 10K, you've paid 5,000 for it. Um, you did 3,000 pounds worth of damage on a heavy landing or a ground loop. Um, the insurance company writes it off, you get 5K. You then can't really go and buy that aeroplane uh, or at least a similar aeroplane um, with what you've got from the insurance money. Um, so think replacement value rather than what you might actually have paid for the aeroplane. Um, I've seen in my professional capacity a $20 million aircraft insured for $40 million, probably taking it a little bit too far, but it's again, it's something to think about. Um, if in doubt, um, you've probably got an idea as to what your own glider is worth and what you'd want it, um, from a payout if you had an accident or if you've got outstanding finance as well if you've taken out a loan to buy it you kind of might want to make sure that um, if you do have an accident you don't end up then having to pay off a loan uh, without having the insurance funds to pay for it so you know it's something to think about um, pilot wise your aircraft is normally insured for any named pilot um, so uh, you as the owner, any of your syndicate partners, you might want to name one or two other people, maybe your CFI or something like that. But most policies that I've seen, certainly my own, includes any BGA rated instructor. So any assistant or full rated instructor. Um, ground risk is a bit harder to come by, uh, by the sounds of things. A lot of the insurance companies are tending not to offer it right now. But basically, it means if your glider sat on a trailer park, in the middle of winter, you're not flying it, and a hurricane comes through, picks your trailer up, smashes it against the trailer next door, uh, your insurance will cover you for it. Now, it would anyway, but it doesn't give you any flying risks cover. So you've got your aircraft on ground risk, you can't fly it, uh, but it's insured if uh, anything bad should happen to it whilst it's on the trailer park. Can offer a saving if you're going to put it in a barn over winter and not fly it. Personally, I don't bother. I leave mine on full flight risk all the year round because... Uh, I got my gold height two days before Christmas Day and my uh, my diamond height two days before Christmas Day and my gold height on New Year's Eve. So uh, I fly pretty much all year round. The saving's not really worth it. I'd rather have an aircraft that I can use, uh, but it's kind of your own discretion, really. So you've got your glider, you've got it home. Um, brilliant. Uh, you're going to have an absolute whale of a time. And the first thing, get back onto your CFI. Tell him you've bought it, it's on site, and you want to fly it. Um, don't just rock up, rig, jump in and go, read the flight manual, and pretend everything is going to be okay. It won't. Um, all you're going to do is upset people, probably hurt yourself. Um, get your CFI on side. Anyone that knows that particular type, manage it. For the sake of one or two check flights, um, you might well be off checks. You might have your bronze or silver already. A couple of flights with an instructor and they'll kind of um, manage and ease that conversion into your own airplane so it doesn't feel quite as much um, of a jump as you know it might be. Um, we talk a lot about kind of managing and mitigating flying risk. Um, say you bought a new airplane, um, it might be your first class single seater. It's not unusual. Uh, I've got a couple of um, customers and a few friends who bought their first class single seater. 
rip the panel out over winter and put a new panel into it. All of a sudden, you've got your first class single seater with a panel in it that may or may not work. You might not necessarily be current. Probably want to let someone else have a go in your new toy first, all right? Just to make sure everything works and to manage that flying risk and to make it as safe and as predictable as possible. Um, I'm going to come back to this a couple of times, but then get in and fly it. Fly the aeroplane, fly the pants off it. It's going to take you probably at least a season before you're really, really comfortable in that aeroplane. Fly it on non sorable days. Rig it, go do a couple of circuits, do a couple of aero toes. Um, nothing beats familiarity. You've got to be really comfortable when you're going out cross country in that aeroplane for the first time. You know you can drop it into that field that you've picked down there. Um, and you're only going to get that comfort by flying. Um, aircraft equipment. Um, this list is endless. I'll start by saying that right away. Um, I've got a bucket in the front of my trailer that's got uh, tape, cleaning kits, so silicon-free polish uh, for fuselage, Aerolac or liquid glass. You get them both from Nav Boys, LX Avionics, online, take your pick. Uh, canopy polish, Plexus is brilliant. Uh, again, I use Plexus. It keeps everything nice and clean. Um, canopy polish, microfiber cloth as well. Uh, you probably want a bug cloth for getting bugs off your wings when you get back after a particularly buggy summer day. Um, chamois for keeping everything nice and dry. Rudimentary toolkit. You know, have a look around the aeroplanes like, right, I know that needs a Phillips head screwdriver, that needs a flat head screwdriver. Keep an aircraft toolkit together so you've got everything, uh, so you've got all the tools that you need in your trailer, um, all stored safely um, in the aircraft where it can't become a loose article risk. Um, canopy cover, uh, these are pretty crucial. Canopies get, and cockpits get really, really, really hot on sunny days. Um, canopy cover will keep the heat off everything. There's nothing worse than having left your aircraft parked out for three hours on a hot blue day, climbing into a cockpit and everything is hot. Stick, seat, buckles, they, like seat buckles are really, really crippling and uncomfortable when they get hot. And they've got a really nasty habit of finding that one tiny bit of exposed skin. A bit like being in a car. Um, tie downs, you might swear you'll never leave your aeroplane outside. Um, I did that until my first 500k. I landed about seven o'clock in the evening and I was absolutely knackered. Uh, parked it out, just stuck a trestle under it and walked away because uh, that was the best that I could manage. But, you know, rope and a couple of irons, um, just some pegs to tie your aircraft down with. Little things like this is stuff that you'll forget that you haven't necessarily got or just, you know, you can get really, really easily. Um, spare tyre. You know, I uh, was at Port Moak four or five years ago. Club Expedition were driven up. Someone uh, turned their Ventus out to the launch point. For no apparent reason, the tyre just fell off the rim. Um, that could have been the end of his expedition. He had a spare in his trailer. Quickly took the tyre off, replaced it, put it back on, problem solved. So a spare tyre and tube, worth having. Tail wheels are the ones that normally go, to be fair. Um, proactive care is really, really important when it comes to looking after your aeroplane. There's a reason why... When everyone gets back, um, they're on the trailer park, they give everything a good wipe down and clean before they go flying. Um, old bugs are really hard to get off wings, um, especially when they're dried on. Get them off when they're nice and soft before they've baked on and been sat there. Um, it also bugs degrade performance of your aeroplane quite badly, um, which you'll know from your bronze exam. Um, keep it nice and clean. You know, it's your baby. Look after it. Um, canopies. Uh, my canopy normally gets cleaned twice, once when it comes out of the trailer because it's invariably a bit dusty once before it goes back in to get all the bugs uh, off the canopy and normally off the trailing edge as well because I'm not very quick. Um, clean canopy is so, so important. You know, you could be coming back in, um, and I've seen this happen countless times. Denby is a really good example. You're landing on the westerly runway, shortest day of the year, sun's quite low, bugs, mud, dirt, grease, anything on the canopy, all of a sudden it turns your canopy a pack. You're approaching into uh, low light, turn on to find the approach and you can't see anything. Oh, should have cleaned cop canopy as much as we could before we left um and again come back to fly the airplane fly it as much as you can get used to rigging it how it goes in and out of the trailer little stuff like that will stand you in really really good stead um and you never know I, my first season with my dg um i was flying half an hour 45 minute flights just to get comfortable with the airplane it's my first kind of real flapped glider just get used to it you know you're not it's going to take you probably a good season to get a good feel for how that aeroplane flies how you fly it how you respond what the instruments are telling you what the glider is telling you more importantly uh, as well um so you've had your glider for the first 12 months there or thereabouts here's a couple of things that you would have come across uh, in that time your insurance that's annual um you can pay monthly um but you're probably going to get a bill every year here's a warning for you public health warning insurance rates are only going up right now um, we're going to come on to costs in a couple of slides time. 
Uh, next slide, actually. Um, insurance costs are going up. All right, there's lots of different reasons for it. I'm not going to go into them now, but expect your insurance to go up. The only thing that will knock the edge off an insurance increase is your qualification level. Uh, used to be badges, tends to be instructor ratings now. Um, you may find experience on type makes a bit of a difference. It might just soften the impact of the price going up at the minute, to be honest. Um, there's very little you can do about it. Um, repairs and modifications. You can do an awful lot yourself. The list is getting ever longer. Um, Gordon uh, McDonald did a webinar. It's on the BGA YouTube uh, page on pilot owner maintenance. It's about two and a half hours long, so um, sit down with a nice cup of coffee. Um, there's some really, really interesting content in there um, as to what you can do. Gordon makes it very simple and approachable. If you have a handy dandy inspector on hand um, that can talk you through stuff, um, all the better. Does say as part of pilot owner maintenance, do not attempt anything that you are not comfortable doing. Sounds really, really simple. Uh, <laughs> pack it in, Rich. Um, annual maintenance, um, inspection and arc. These are not the same thing. Um, at its simplest, inspection is a physical inspection of the aeroplane um, structure. You will know what is wrong with that aeroplane when the annual inspection comes around. There'll be something that's niggling you, you know, oh, it squeaks when we turn left, um, or, you know, the tailwheel shimmy, anything like that. That's the chance to get in and fix it, find out what's causing it. You know, there might be some running repairs that you've done through the winter uh, or through the summer. You know, a gear door that came off in a field that was hastily um, kind of bandaged back on that you now want to fix properly and make sure it doesn't happen again. Scratches in the nose, scratches in the paint from exactly the same sort of thing. Um, you know, you might just put some tape over them. You know, the annual inspection isn't just an inspection. It's a time for you to really start digging and making that aeroplane ready for um, next season so that come the first 300k day of the year, you're happy, you're comfortable, you haven't left anything to chance. Um, the BGA inspector scheme is ending um, at the end of this year uh, to do with the ARSA. Inspectors from the 1st of December, I think it's either the 1st of December or 1st of January, got to be in the ARSA licensed L1 engineer um, to sign off any work packs. This kind of links back into Gordon's webinar. Um, if in doubt, read that, call your local inspector. Um, we're all friendly, most of us can help you. Um, your glider will need a radio license if you've got a fixed installation. It's 20 pounds for three years. You get it from Ofcom, fill in a piece of paper, um, collect three or four packs of conflict packets, um, send them off and they'll send you a piece of paper back that goes in the ship's documents. Uh, weighing, you need to glide a weight every eight years. That's extendable nine years now, thanks to COVID. Um, a lot of this, your, inspect your local friendly inspector will help you with. Um, and that's pretty much it for running it. These are not difficult airplanes to run and manage. Really, it's no worse than having a kind of fun car, which brings us on to the costs. Um, with great trepidation, this is broadly speaking what my own airplanes cost me over the last couple of years, give or take. All right, these are uh, reasonably good guide, and it's a, more than anything else, it's a good order of magnitude. Um, insurance, um, for me as a BJ rated instructor, um, got most of the badges and 100 hours on type. My insurance has been working out, I think last my last renewal was about 450. I'm expecting that to go up to 600 pounds next year, there or thereabouts. Um, parking at my club uh, is 300 pounds a year. Your club mileage may vary. Um, some clubs give you it, some it's more than that. Um, annual inspection. Um, I found this is a new one. I found out last week you can now, under uh, BJ's part CAO, you can now do your own annual inspection. Um, I would still leave a budget in there for someone to come out and do it for me um, just because that's me to be honest I'd rather have someone else uh, validate and verify my own kind of thoughts and feelings arc fee is what you've got to pay the BGA every year 116 pounds it was last year um, non-negotiable um, and that's normally on top of the annual inspection upkeep um, this is boring stuff um, this year my trailer needed two new tires you know it's things like tape cleaning equipment spares, you know, the sort of nauseam that you'd be inclined to forget about were it not for the fact that you're trying to build a budget for a big webinar for people. Um, this figure varies. It's a really good number to aim for. This worked out, broadly speaking, at just under £1,400 near as makes no difference, £1,366. £113 a month. If you budget for something around here at about £125, £130 a month, there or thereabouts, you're probably not going to have any nasty shocks or surprises. Um, 
that works out based on 50 hours, 45 p a minute. Um, that's the same rate as a 19 or a peg at my club. Um, that's brilliant value for me, quite frankly. Um, I've got my own aeroplane. I know how much it's costing me. Yeah, why would you not? Um, quite frankly, these numbers again are good for order of magnitude. Um, 130 pounds a month. I've got friends that pay more for a gym membership that don't use it. All right, this is why I don't pay for a gym membership. I'd rather pay for a glider and not use that instead. So, yeah, they're pretty much the uh, kind of numbers that you're looking at, broadly speaking. Somewhere between 100 and 150 pounds a month is about right. Um, syndicates normally split these costs equally as well. So, um, you know, if you're in a, if you're in half or a third of an aeroplane, um, you can expect to see about a third of that, there or thereabouts. Um, that's pretty much it for buying, owning, running, and everything else. Um, it's one of the things that kind of made a huge difference to my flying was owning my own aeroplane. Um, or and you will find that having access to your own aeroplane, becoming less reliant on club aircraft, transforms your own flying. It really, really does. You know, there's no turning up at seven o'clock in the morning to find the, both the club ships are booked, or you know, um, you got back and nothing's and you know. There's been uh, one of the uh, your favourite club airplanes offline. Um, someone spiked it into the field a couple of days previous. So, a uh, couple of questions then. Um, Luke finally got to the bottom. Luke, that's why you're in a Nimbus two. Um, next question, Clive. Annual typical cost for launches. I don't include these. I work on the basis when I'm building a budget that, regardless of what I am flying, I would probably pay for the launches anyway even if I was in a club aeroplane. So the budget that I put up here, um, that kind of assumes that I would do the flying anyway. It'd be 50 hours in a club aeroplane. So I kind of just dropped it out. Rich, uh, I'd recommend a DG200 to absolutely anyone. Uh, comfortable, bomb-proof, go like a rocket. Um, G Day flew one in the Nationals a couple of months ago and did pretty well. Um, mine's not for sale at the minute, although it made me a good offer. Um, uh, in all seriousness, I bought that glider. I've got my silver, um, done a little bit of cross country in the club discus and some other stuff. I uh, did my first 300, first two regionals, first 500, gold height and diamond height in that aeroplane. Um, it's insured for 17 and a half. Um, that's replacement value. You could spend half of that and end up with an aeroplane that would do exactly what that aeroplane has done for me. Um, I really, really do recommend having your own aeroplane to anyone. Nimbus 2s are amazing. Yeah, they're not bad. Um, although uh, I'd quite like a go on at some point, actually. Uh, James, any thoughts about rigging? Um, yeah, get really, really comfortable. Read the book before you do it for the first time. And if in doubt, get people in that know how to put it together. Um, there was a very, very, very sad rigging accident at my old club about six years ago. Um, as a, One of the factors was an experience in rigging the aeroplane. Um, Probably not going to be a massive factor with most of the stuff that people are looking at now. You know, it's pretty easy to see if you've not rigged a, um, something like a discus run because there's only one pin. It goes right through the wing. That's it. You know, it, it's, it's quite hard not to get that wrong. Um, but read the book. Be really, really comfortable. And your first couple of times, get someone to have a look. I did with um, the 200. I just got someone else to kind of verify that the tailplane was on properly. That's been a really big gotcha on Cirrus's recently. Um, but all the controls are done up and they've got our clips through them if they're not self-connecting. Um, personally, I tend not to leave my aeroplane out. I do rig it every night because it takes me 10 minutes. It takes me longer to wipe it down. If I've left it out, it's probably because uh, I'm too tired and can't be bothered. I just want to go to the bar and have a beer after a, uh, probably a long air. So retrieve last year's anything to go by. Um, Ollie Ramsey, do bronze silver qualifications knock down insurance by a substantial amount? Mm, they make a difference. Um, the more experience you've got, the um, in theory, the lower your insurance premium will be. Um, I'd probably really like someone to do it, actually stick your hand up if you'd be good at it, um, a webinar on insurance factors and all that sort of stuff, because I do find it quite interesting. The more experience you've got, the more qualifications you've got, the greater the likelihood of um, there being a positive impact on your premium. Positive means reducing in this instance. Um, John, oh, I don't know you. Um, we recently had to update our radios, possibly install FLAM. Any idea of other requirements on the horizon? Um, if you've got radio and FLAM, you're probably okay. Transponder is going to be the next one. Um, I can't see transponder and ADSB out ever really becoming mandatory, certainly not in the next couple of years. 
Um, it's probably useful to have it, especially if you're somewhere like Lasham, Southdown, even my club at Booker, just because of the volume of control airspace around. Um, again, think of it as the crash hat analogy. Um, I don't have one because I use it um, or I rely on it for my collision avoidance. I've got one because somebody else out there might be. All right. Um, flying out of Bicester was quite revealing. We had a lot of traffic going into um, Oxford on the ILS, which was about five miles um, away from our local soaring area. Um, you could be reasonably sure that on any busy flying day, someone would have a close call with one of the Senecas going down the ILS with two people on it, one of them under foggles, the instructor not paying a lot of attention. So, you know, things like electronic conspicuity, really, really big things at the minute. Um, there's also free money available. Um, the CAA are giving grants of up to £250 um, or half of the value of any equipment that you're fitting. Uh, not mandatory, but if you fly on an 833 dot, you're probably pretty much good to go for certainly the next couple of years that I can think of. Uh, handling aids, I'm presuming you mean ground handling aids. Um, the biggest, the best handling aids kind of experience, really. Um, yeah, wing wheel, tow arm, turbo. You can buy this stuff, but it's expensive. Um, you can make it if you're pretty crafty. Um, I did, I've seen aircraft written off because of bad handling, ground handling equipment. Um, DG100 up at Dish, I think it was, somewhere back in time. Um, the tail dolly, the tailing arm failed, the car broke, the glider went into the back of it. They were going pretty quick and downhill at the time, and the mangled mess was an insurance right off afterwards. And that was, uh, I think it was a tail dolly or a tailing arm that failed. So, yeah, good handling equipment is pretty important, to be honest. Uh, who do I insure with? I'm with Haywards. Uh, I've been with Haywards for years. There's a lot to be said for broker loyalty. Um, Richard will also say that was my premium right at the beginning of this year, and I am expecting it to go up. I'm expecting north 500, uh, probably about 550, 600 this year. I also had a small period, about four months of uh, ground risk insurance, um, which extended from COVID into me doing a 3,000 hour check because I had nothing else to do what's been sat at home bored and playing condor. Toby, if you think a one-man rigging aid might fall over it, well, um, yeah, one-man rigging aids. Fine on two seaters with a single seater. I'm not convinced, really, uh, unless it's a really big, heavy one. Is it worth not knowing ADs that the glide um, Well, potentially, but again, it's the sort of thing that um, you'd pick up in a pre-purchase. Uh, the BJ Form 285, and I haven't got one handy, um, is great for showing AD compliance, what's coming up when it's due and anything like that. Um, yeah, it makes a difference to some aeroplanes. Um, most of it's manageable. Most of it you pick up at annual inspection anyway. Pilot aware. Uh, yeah, I've got pilot aware. I use it in my Robin. Uh, it's brilliant. Um, personally, I'd probably go down the Sky Echo route um, just because it's a bit neater than pilot aware, um, but they both work really, really well. Any thoughts on turbos and fezzes? Steve Jones? Hang on. Um, yeah, um, I do, but they're probably not contact, relevant in the context of buying your first aeroplane. Speak to your CFI. Um, they'll be the most important ones. Uh, is it worth it to do it yourself? Pros and cons? Um, I don't know. This is a new, this was a new one to me. It came up a couple of days ago on the BJA webinar, actually. Gordon's webinar again. Uh, many free plugs for him there. Um, is it worth it to do it yourself? Personally, i probably still get somebody else to do it. Quite frankly, um, think resale. You know, if I'm looking at an aeroplane, uh, if I can see that um, an inspector or you know someone who I know that's reputable has signed off an aeroplane five, six, seven, eight years in a row, um, that would probably speak volumes to me. Um, you know, there's a couple of people. Every club's got that one or two people who try and help in the workshop, but you probably wouldn't give them anything more than a broom or a Hoover. Um, yeah, think about that when you're in the aeroplane. Um, is it worth it to do it yourself? Is it worth it? Well, it'd be cheaper. Is it worth it? Difficult one to call. Um, personally, I even if I wasn't an inspector, I'd probably still, merely from the point of view of maintaining residual asset value, I'd probably get someone else to do it for me. Uh, I mean, even as an inspector, I'd probably get someone to do my own annual inspection next year to verify kind of um, my own thoughts and thinkings. Uh, yes, my DG is under the BGA camera. Um, uh, any more questions? There's a couple of people typing, Toby, Kevin, John, some. Still an orange juice. Miracle. Yeah, also, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, Toby, 100%. Um, I, I have been known to be very, very blunt when rigging, de-rigging, for which I make no apologies. Um, it is possible to hurt yourself. You know, rain's coming down sideways or at the top of a windy hill and you're holding a big piece of wing that's acting like a great big sail. Um, yeah, I'm going to get pushy. I'm going to get bolshy, uh, for which I make no apology. Uh, Kevin, Leo, any more? No, that's it. All thanks. Um, there are my contact details, uh, milesinstinctofaviation.co.uk, my phone number, um, or find me at your nearest airfield. Thanks very much, guys. Good evening.